Welcome in. My name is Pat Boyle Mann. I'm a parishioner at St. John the Baptist Episcopal Church in Portland on the OES campus. I'm also past president and currently serving on the board of William Temple House. And I just retired after a 44 year career in the radio news as a reporter and anchor. I'm happy to be here. It's my honor, actually. I am with the Reverend Mary Cockett, who is a pastor in Cody, Wyoming. You've spent 22 of your 27 years as a priest there. And we're happy to have you here today. And I wondered if you would uh, say a prayer for our interview, our conversation. I would be happy to open with a prayer. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious God, giver of all good gifts, we give you thanks for the beauty of this day, for the beauty of creation, for love and life and laughter. And we thank you for all the ways that you enrich our lives in your presence, with your presence. And thank you for having been a rock in our past, for making us alive in the present. And with every breath we take, we thank you for calling us in promise and in hope to your future. We find ourselves in tumultuous and disquieting times. May we find our rest in you. Turn our anxiety into trust and faith. Give us eyes to see, hearts to love, hands to care. Fill your body on this earth with your spirit. Guide and direct the people of Oregon in their discernment. May they find you a strong companion. And I pray for Diana and Tanya and Andrew and myself in our discernment as well. May we rest in you as you live in us. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you very much. I know that you uh, have been a priest in Cody, Wyoming, and also three years in Massachusetts, yes. correct? But most of your time in Wyoming. Uh, you're a graduate of Trinity University in San Antonio. Yep. I think your resume said you like to garden and cook. Is that uh, right? Yes, I do. What else can you tell us about you? <laughs> well, my entire family loves the outdoors. And part of what we love about Wyoming and what drew me to the West from having grown up in Minnesota, was the great outdoors and being able to be in the beauty of God's creation. And we love to hike and camp and backpack. And my husband fishes and he's teaching our 15 year old daughter to fish as well. So um, we just love to find God sort of in the beauty of this created world, as well as the risen Christ in our midst, in our communities. Um, but we, we, are all, we are drawn to the West, and that's part of why I was really interested in coming to know Oregon better, because it's, it's the West as well. It's usually not as hot as it is today, I'll just tell you. <laughs> it is a little hot for people from Wyoming. We're at a little bit higher elevation. It's a little cooler. Can you tell us about your path to the priesthood and what led you here today? Sure. And how much time do we have? <laughs> well, 35 minutes overall, so maybe bullet points. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, when I was in undergraduate, I had an early experience when I was first dropped off by my parents a thousand miles from home, and I was supposed to be in the honors program, and then it turns out they didn't have my name. So it was my first adulting kind of experience to have to advocate for myself in that. And uh, the honors program folks were very welcoming, but they said the freshman honors class is full, the only honors class you can take is something called contemporary religious thought. And I don't think I would have ever taken a religion class. I am a cradle Episcopalian, uh, but I wasn't thinking about studying uh, religion. But that class really changed my life. And it was serendipitous to be invited into it. And that, I think, for me, has been often how I see the spirit act. 
So if you would say, at any point in my life, where do you think you will be five years from now? I could say something, but I can pretty much guarantee I would never be right. So I uh, majored in religion. I went to seminary to explore a call to the priesthood, uh, confirmed that call to the priesthood uh, through uh, studying in seminary in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts at the then Episcopal Divinity School and was ordained a, a deacon and worked for a year as a hospital chaplain and thought perhaps I would do chaplaincy. I also worked as a prison chaplain. But then right when I was ordained a priest, I was invited to serve on a, in a congregation with a staff of six clergy. I was the first woman and I would have never guessed I would have found myself there after my very liberal seminary experience. My first congregation was a right one parish who had had a lot of difficulty transitioning to the new prayer book and were pretty much pretending like the new prayer book didn't exist. And I found a home there. Uh, and then from there came to uh, Pinedale, Wyoming, which is a, a small town in Wyoming, where I met my husband, Casey, and the love of my life, and a real gift from God as well. And we decided we would do a little city experience, and so we moved to Boston and realized that uh, Boston was not really the place for us. He is a native Wyomingite. He's a fourth generation uh, Wyoming boy. And so we came back to Wyoming, and. 14 plus years now we've been in Cody and there was a series of, of surprise wonderful sorts of invitations that happened three of them on my way to imagining putting my name in here in Oregon and the first was just noticing and my bishop invited me to consider uh, putting my name in here and I thought mm, I wasn't really sure, but my husband has family here and that sounded possible. And then uh, an old friend called and said, hey, I'm in Oregon now. I think you'd be great. And I still thought, hmm. And then I got a call from the search committee saying, whatever that algorithm is in the computers and the National Episcopal Church has spat out your name. And I thought about that joke that people tell where the guy comes to the pearly gates after he drowned and said, God, I cried out for you to save me and you didn't save me. And God says, well, you know, I, you were on your top of your house. I sent you a boat and you said, no, I don't need that boat because I'm waiting for God to save me. And I sent you a helicopter and I think there was some other thing that I sent you and you always said no. And so here you are at the pearly gates I offered you three times to be saved. So I thought, wow, I should probably open the door after three knocks. And it's just been a wonderful process to be involved in with you all and to get to know folks in Oregon and the ministry here in Oregon. It's been a little odd because of COVID. And I'm thinking that how this might have unfolded or how we would have thought it would have unfolded back around Christmas time is very different from the world that we inhabit right now. And we're all at the same starting line. So there's kind of almost a bonding in it, isn't there? Yes, there is. It's now, I understand either from your resume or your application that you embrace an Ignatian spirituality. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Um, in, in that uh, large conservative con congregation it, where I first served uh, as a priest and associate rector, they ha employed a quarter-time spiritual director, and there was another spiritual director further out in the St. Louis area, and they got together and offered what we call the Annotation 19 Ignatian Retreats, which is Ignatian spirituality invites folks to do something called the 30-day silent retreat to really come in deeply into their relationship with Christ. 30 days. but. St. Ignatius realized that if you were not about to be a Jesuit priest, it is unlikely that you would be able to commit 30 days at one time. And so Ignatius himself thought, well, how can we make this more available to lay people, actually, and to women? 
And so he came up with this idea that you could do the 30 days in daily life. It would just take you a lot longer. And so I worked in partnership with these two women who were both lay women and who were needing a priest to be able to offer the sacraments in an Annotation 19 style retreat. And I never looked back. It felt like it really, uh, Ignatian spirituality paired really well with my spiritual sensibilities, uh, commitment to justice, commitment to the least among us, and a use of the imagination in prayer. So using scripture as a tool for prayer rather than as the book that you use to hit people over the head with. So uh, opening up scripture, praying with it imaginatively and allowing God to speak in your own spirit today, right now. And that has been very life-giving for me. And I had the opportunity to take a sabbatical recently. And the final bit of that sabbatical was to do the 30-day retreat. And the challenge news was it came right in the middle of some of the discernment with Oregon. And the folks on the search committee were incredibly patient with me when I could not speak to anybody for about 35 days, uh, right, in, right before they were inviting us to a retreat. What do you learn when you're quiet for 30 days? I, I, for, me, for me, I learned a couple of things, but I think everybody in quiet learns to listen to that still small voice of the spirit, which is often drowned out with so many demands and voices that are like the cacophony of our daily lives. And so we'll often say, oh, we should be listening for the voice of God. But there are so many voices, it makes it difficult to hear that quiet voice of the Spirit and peeling away all of those other voices and just being quiet for that amount of time gives God really depth of field to work with in our spirits. And the idea in Ignatian spirituality is that as we learn to listen and hear and follow more the call of God in our lives, we soften those other voices that are the voices of our own will and our own pride and really be able to more effectively follow where God leads. Thank you. Now we have seven questions today. The uh, bishop candidates have received the questions in advance, so there are no surprises here. It's not Pat making up questions. They actually were submitted by members of the diocese. I think maybe 150 were submitted, seven were chosen. So here we go with question number one. As you go through this hiring process to be Bishop of Oregon, the country is simultaneously experiencing the seismic sudden change in consciousness regarding the relationship of the local police and the community. This is, of course, due to the recent spontaneous demonstrations supporting the Black Lives Matters movement. Portland and other Oregon cities have experienced this mood for change. How do you see the Diocese of Oregon engaging in the work of this movement in more than just a supportive role? Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank, you. Thank you. I find it delightful that we are finally listening again there are so many voices clamoring for our attention. It's not like George Floyd was the first African-American man to be unjustly killed by a police officer. And it has seemed like in the past when these tragic events happen, the event happens, people respond, and then we go back to our daily lives. And there is something of the gift of COVID-19, I think, that has put all of us in a pause in our lives and has given us maybe a little bit of that silence that we would not have been able to take on our own. And I hope that that will have lasting impact uh, in our lives, certainly. Uh, it does seem like that we are at a place of, of opportunity and invitation. I'm intrigued by the word supportive, like how can we do something that's more than just play a supportive role uh, in all of this? And I was, I'm thinking, I don't know who wrote the question and they're not here to ask, but if supportive means standing on the sidelines, wringing our hands and hoping it will just get better, then certainly I believe that's not the role for us. But if what we mean by supportive is 
intentional, faithful allyship and followership and really being in it for the long run with our brothers and sisters and siblings who are black, indigenous, and people of color, as well as others who are marginalized in various ways uh, in our society today, then I think supportive really often is the role that perhaps we are being called to make. Many of us, I think, in the Episcopal Church are accustomed by our white privilege to think that our role is always going to be a leadership role. Uh, and I'm thinking for support that we might need to adopt a spiritual attitude of, of listening, humility and discernment, followed by action. Many of us, I think, just want to jump in both feet first and say, we're going to make a difference here. And I think the first difference we can make is actually being listeners and, and hearing and discerning and listening to scripture, uh, which has a lot to say about the situation that we're in, uh, listening to our close friends at church and, and kind of hearing deeply, listening to uh, black indigenous people of color voices, listening to our neighbors outside the church. And I've been thinking again serendipitously in a very Holy Spirit way, back in March when we went into COVID lockdown in Cody, we were sort of looking for something to do for some people who had extra time. And we had stumbled across a curriculum out of the presiding bishop's office called Sacred Ground, Conversations on Race and Faith. And it's a, a 10 encounter curriculum that has a lot of reading, some uh, video watching along with it. But the power of the curriculum is in a sacred circle of conversation and listening. It's primarily for actually for white people or for mixed groups, mixed race groups. And we were on, I think, week four when George Floyd was killed. And for the 12 of us in Cody, Wyoming, it was super powerful to orient how we thought about our response. And out of that came some amazing things. Uh, early on, it's listening and discerning uh, and just kind of making space for God to speak and not being quick to jump into things. But by the end of our 10 week session, uh, we had found out that our own church has a racial covenant in its deed. And I'm guessing that many churches would be surprised to find that that is the case for them. So for us, our deed said uh, no uh, Negroes, Mexicans, Chinese or Indians could purchase the land. and. There were some people who thought, why would you make a change? Because you're not going to sell your church anyway. And even if you did, those racial covenants are no longer enforceable. But we felt like there was something rotten at our core. And so we did find that it is almost impossible to excise that language from a deed, from an original deed. So we put an a, a, de a notarized addendum to our deed that will now be part of the permanent record of our church and we are encouraging uh, other churches around Wyoming and for our friends and neighbors in Cody, uh, we're encouraging folks in old Cody. There's about a 70 year period where every lot had a racial covenant in it. So many of the people who live in my town have that and I understand that that's probably the case uh, in many places in Oregon as well that there are those racially restrictive covenants in the deeds. And then uh, we also had the opportunity to partner with some neighbors out in the community who were planning a, a peaceful protest against racism. And we did a lot of work together for that. And we did not encounter the same uh, sorts of responses that folks in Portland are encountering in the protest in Portland, uh, but we had our own unique Wyoming experience in that we, our city park was ringed uh, by uh, good old boys with uh, AR-15s who were there to protect Cody and Cody's businesses from the Antifa who might be coming in. So it was a very, um, a very fraught time and to imagine what does it mean to uh, be peacefully protesting racism and see your neighbors who are carrying uh, some very high-powered weapons 
who see you as that kind of a threat. So it has been a, uh, we have moved to action and our next action has been to share with the entire Diocese of Wyoming that we found this curriculum really transformative uh, for a small group of folks in Cody. And so this fall, we are we're expanding from one circle to three circles and we are inviting people from around the diocese and we have uh, a little over 30 uh, people from all around the diocese who will be joining the conversation circles and um, i don't think there is one answer for every context and i think each one of our contexts is going to be different in terms of what we're called to do in response to the Black Lives Matter protests. And there may be a congregation in Portland who is called to live into this in a way that's very different from uh, a congregation in Medford or a small town on the coast. And the joy about being in the body of Christ is that we don't all have to be an ear, that God will lead each one of us. Some of us are the eyeballs or the small toe or whatever our particular place is, and we're all called to respond to the Spirit's leadership in our own context in different ways. So I'm interested to see the diversity of response that will come out here in the Diocese of Oregon. Do you see maybe having the, uh, that, those circles here in the diocese? Yeah. If it worked in Wyoming, could it work here? Yeah, I'm actually thinking that uh, there, ha there has been at least one circle here. I've been looking at who's doing them across the country. Uh, the, it, this came out of the presiding bishop's office and uh, I think St. Philip the Deacon in Port Portland yes. actually sponsored a circle for people from Portland. And the power of the circles I found is that we had people in our circle who said things at the beginning like, I don't understand racism, I think it's all over. That, you know, it doesn't exist anymore. And we had uh, a woman who teaches in African American studies and religion at the University of Wyoming all in the same group. And so some people found the reading incredibly challenging. Some people found the reading, well, I kind of knew that. But the power was really in the conversation in the circle. And I can't imagine that that wouldn't, that power wouldn't translate well into the Diocese of Oregon. Thank you. The second question, um, you will become bishop in the middle of a pandemic in a nation suffering from racial injustice, which we were just talking about, and the fallout of a very contentious presidential election. How will you lead the people of this diocese in bringing about healing, action, and unity? Okay. Healing, action, and unity. I just finished a, a doctoral program uh, just over a year ago, it's hard to believe that, and it was in uh, missional Christian leadership. And one of the things we spent a lot of time exploring was the depth and breadth of God's mission in our world. And uh, really the mission of God is the reconciliation of all things in Christ. And so the, the healing piece is God's mission for all of us. We are more aware today than ever, perhaps because we're on this COVID pause, of how much we really do need the healing power of Christ. Uh, we are in our own bunkers, basically, politically, uh, geographically, religiously even, and, and people are getting better and better and better at, at building the walls higher and higher uh, and assuming that everybody inside their bunker or their enclave is right and good and true and just and a, anybody who's living outside is the opposite. And I can imagine God's probably again weeping at humanity and we are called as christians to imagine that broader project of reconciliation and that kind of healing takes again deep listening it takes some humility which is a virtue that i realize even my in my own life as a priest i have not had the opportunity to cultivate very much it's not a virtue that is valued in our society. We are a taking society, a me society, an individualistic society. And, and for God's reconciliation to work, we need to be making space for the other uh, and inviting that other person in. Uh, 
But we're not doing that alone, and we're not doing that just with our own little broken, prideful selves. We're doing that, actually, with the power of the risen Christ uh, within us and around us and inviting us forward, and that always gives us an incredible amount of hope. So as a leader, I think, um, not just the bishop, but I'm hoping that all the leadership in the church in Oregon can adopt that sense of a listening humility that allows others to enter in and experience transformation, reconciliation, and healing. But sometimes we have to let go of our own need to be right and to have fixed it now. I can probably speak to that, especially because in the Myers-Briggs, I'm one of those INFJs. And so the last letter means I'm a judging person and that I like to have clarity and closure uh, in my life. And my experience of the healing power of God is that, at least for me, I need to be more open and allow some of that to bear fruit in its own time. So that's the, the healing and the action is to after we have spent that time listening and we are hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit uh, in scripture, among us, and out there in the lives of our neighbors who may or may not be claiming a Christian identity, but the spirit is actually active out there as well as it is in here. Then we kind of hike up our pants and follow wherever it is that she's leading us uh, into action. But we don't then just take the reins from God and do our own action. We do that action and take a moment and reflect and discern again and then act some more. I found it really interesting this morning when we were at a bilingual congregation, uh, St. Michael and San Miguel, where there was a tr simultaneous or almost simultaneous translation happening. It sort of slowed us down and helped us listen. Uh, somebody could speak in one language and then a translation would happen and the rest of us could just take a breath. Uh, and I'm thinking that that's some kind of transcultural gift that's been given to this diocese that at least I hadn't identified before, perhaps uh, the rest of you have identified that. And unity, finally. I think in, in the Christian world and the secular world agree that unity is found in sameness or that we all have to be um, we have to either all be the same as each other or we all have to be fighting a common enemy. But in the early Christian church, uh, in the New Testament, we find that unity is celebrated in diversity. And that's why Paul has that great image of the body of Christ and uh, all the various spiritual gifts. And that, in fact, diversity is heightened in Christian faith and life. And unity is found in the mission of reconciliation. But we all are given various gifts for ministry and we are all living in different contexts. And so it's going to look different. And if what our litmus test for unity is, is sameness or a common enemy, we will miss the transformative power of God in the spirit of the risen Christ that is given to us in really highlighting and growing our diversity. And the only diversity that gets quenched is a diversity that leads to injustice. All right, thank you. Um, third question, COVID-19, again, has changed the way we worship. What do you envision for us as we navigate into the months and possibly the years ahead? I mean, we've all learned about Zoom this year, haven't we? Yes, yes. So I, I'm thinking there's something in the question about worship, but I, I think that there, there might be more than worship. It, it really touches at the base of our identity and, uh, and our culture and all the ways that we gather. So I'm kind of laughing to myself about God's ironic sense of humor, at least in my life. Can't really speak <laughs> for yours. I, I <laughs> but I feel like COVID-19 has, has been an irony for me that I just finished this doctoral work and in the doctoral work, we did a lot of studying and learning about adaptive challenges. And those are the kind of challenges that are uh, sticky and long lasting and they impact the entire culture of your organization or your church. It's not just fixing a broken furnace like a technical challenge. And when we were studying and I was writing my dissertation, I was sure should teach me not to hold tight and be sure about stuff, but I was sure that our adaptive challenge had to do with the fact that our churches in the Episcopal Church, our congregations are shrinking. 
by and large, and we are living in an increasingly secular world, and our adaptive challenge, primary adaptive challenge, is how to engage our unchurched neighbors, and how do we uh, bring the, that good news of the gospel out into the world, not in a way that is a colonistic, colonialistic or imperialistic top-down mission, we've got something and you're lacking something, but is very mutual and saying like, well, how is the spirit in your life and our life and we'll, we'll do this work? And I was very excited about this. So then COVID happened and I realized I'm, I'm glad that God gave me the opportunity to learn about adaptive challenges <laughs> and how to lead in adaptive challenges. But, but perhaps not simply because of the increasing secularization and the, and the shrinking size of congregations, but uh, because of this incredible challenge that is now in our laps that we know as COVID-19, that is not just a flash in the pan. It's, it's going to be our reality. One of the things that I learned and, and have been able to employ uh, in my own congregation and in the work I do as uh, the dean of our region and and inviting other congregations to not be despairing, but actually find hope and gifts in the midst of this adaptive challenge that is COVID, uh, is that leadership is not primarily going to come from the center out or from the top down. Those leadership styles are more to address a technical challenge. If there's one thing that was wrong, we just need to uh, take our knowledge, our know-how, and get it out there by the right people, to the right people. But adaptive challenges take new learning and innovations and small experiments. And some of the best leaders are the people who are lurking around the margins. So one of the things that's been great for me is to be listening, not just to the formal leadership in our churches, but to people who are not already identified as leaders and, and listen deeply and encourage other leaders to be doing the same and then to take some little small experiments. And I think having watched many of your Facebook and YouTube uh, services and seeing what's going on in your websites here in Oregon, you all are engaging in that kind of adaptive learning too because we don't just have to learn how to worship in this time, we have to learn how to uh, learn and, and continue in our Christian formation. We need to learn how to celebrate together in a time where this is as close to anyone I've been other than my husband without a mask in six months, I think. And we need to learn new ways, adaptive ways, to reach out to our neighbors when we can't reach out and touch people as easily as we could. Zoom has been a lifesaver, I think, for Zoom many of us. Zoom has been awesome for us. Um, part two of the question is, what oh. do you see as the diocese role in assisting parishes, urban and rural, mm. large and small, with this COVID world we're in? So in that, the sense of an adaptive challenge. There is a diocesan role, but it might not be the role that a bishop would expect from the past, or even that congregations would expect to be getting from their bishop. So if you have a traditional technical challenge, the bishop tells you what to do. And um, you get, or the bishop says, here's, here's the technical expertise person, and they'll fix it for you. Um, this is something that we all need to be engaging in, in these small experiments, and then when things work, sharing that with each other. And it may be that, you know, the smallest church in the diocese finds something that works that the cathedral can, can take from that small church rather than sort of that top down from, from the diocesan staff. So the role, I believe, of leadership is really to make space and to help connections happen. So not a top down connection and not even a wheel and spokes connection, but to really help the webbing connection where it is definitely a communication issue. And I think that diocesan offices can help connect people with the people who are facing a similar challenge or have tried something new that is working well for them. Uh, and that's just a very different way I think of leading in the world uh, is, is to be more of that bridge builder and connector where the bishop doesn't actually have to be in the center on that bridge, but can trust the spirit to work between these two congregations who will be helping each other. Is your uh, parish Zoom church or Facebook or? Uh, so so our, we are doing our meetings, uh, our education and fellowship on Zoom. 
Uh, we did the sacred ground conversations on Zoom and it was fantastic. That was a great way to do that. Uh, our, our church is on Facebook for our worship and we are offering instead of weekly worship with a one midweek service, we started COVID by offering morning prayer and Compline every day so that there would be a check-in. And um, now we are actually back to worshiping in person. We're a very a rural church in a community that's not heavily impacted uh, by numbers of COVID cases yet. So uh, we are allowed to have uh, 20 individuals or 40 couples or some kind of combination of that and children in the worship space. And we are still FaceTime, or not FaceTime, Facebooking the services uh, for that. But it has been a uh, both, and you know this too, <laughs> intimately going into quarantine and then now we're coming out slightly from quarantine. Week to week, we never know what to expect the next week, exactly. which is actually the truth of the world. And, and we do have to rely on our, our trust in God not knowing what tomorrow is going to bring. But I think for me, at least, and a lot of us, we had this fantasy before COVID that we knew what tomorrow was going to bring. Yep, just a fantasy. All we have is today, isn't it? Uh, question number four, many of our churches in Oregon are struggling to survive. Mm -hmm. What can you do to help them grow? And if those efforts don't succeed, what other options would be on the table? And if you could speak to your own experience. Great. I, I come out of a, a very rural diocese where we went in my first 10 years in that diocese, we went from having, I think, 25 rectors to having nine rectors. So the reality was we were shrinking. We could not afford to, churches couldn't, small churches couldn't afford to pay full-time priests. So I have a, bring a lot of lived experience with small congregations, certainly from the Diocese of Wyoming. And from that experience, I have, learned in spades that small congregations can be extremely vital. Likewise, large congregations rent by conflict can be places of death. So size is no guarantee of vitality or survivability. And I wouldn't actually say, though I am missional in my orientation and I am all about reaching out to our unchurched neighbors and, and engaging with them, I don't see success in terms of the number of, as my senior warden says, butts in the pews. Uh, that sounds like Wyoming talk. <laughs> yes, yes. Although he actually would like more of those, mm -hmm. but that, that's how we count them. Uh, that we don't actually measure our vitality by those numbers. Now, granted, the reality is if you are going to hire a clergy person, that's an expensive proposition. And many of our churches in Wyoming were struggling for survival under the weight of the load of that. And so we moved into a mutual ministry orientation where every congregation uh, is believed, and this I know to be true from the Apostle Paul on, to have the gifts necessary to be the church that God is calling it to be in its time and its place. And those gifts might be spread among a thousand parishioners or they might be spread among 10 parishioners. Now granted, the gift that you might most need is somebody who's not quite come through your door yet. I, this is true as well. But we do have the gifts to be church, whatever our size. And so I, I do understand how to grow church in terms of the, the missional outreach. But I also don't want anyone to get the idea that there is a certain size that is the right size in the eyes of God. It has to do with how full the lives of our spirit are, how much we are engaging our neighbors, how much we are deepening our own walk with Christ. And those things can be measured in small, medium, and large congregations. What would the missional outreach look like, though? Give so me an mission, example. Yeah, so missional outreach, uh, in the work that I did in my doctoral a study, I invited leaders from around the diocese to uh, engage in a process where they gathered with a group of people in their congregation, uh, studied scripture, and studied their neighborhood, and prayed about scripture, and prayed about their neighborhood. And then the next step is to take prayer walks around their neighborhood and listen, and really learn their neighborhoods. And from what I've seen in Oregon, the congregations do a pretty good job knowing their neighborhoods. 
and listening for the needs in the neighborhoods and then not saying I have Jesus and you don't or even I have money and you don't but saying what is already going on that the spirit is enlivening in this neighborhood that we can come alongside and join in so at the uh, in Cody this was not my doctoral research it was just a month and a half ago when we had the peaceful protest against racism there were a little over 300 people there and I counted 65 members of the Episcopal Church who were present in in that and I think that says something for how Episcopalians live their faith so we go out and we build relationships with our neighbors and then we hear from our neighbors what is needed and it may be that our neighbors are as spiritually hungry as we are and they want to come in and worship the way that we do. But we also often hear that our neighbors have lives that are so crazy that the only time they have together as a family is Sunday morning. And in our own church, we did a 10 year experiment with having a Sunday evening service all summer long so that all of our families could be out and about and we were certainly drew in a lot of families with that Sunday evening uh, service. But it really is about listening to the needs of the neighbors and not assuming that we know before we get started what, what other people want or need. Fifth one is please describe your experience with the selection, formation, and deployment of deacons. Great. In Wyoming, we are this mutual ministry diocese, and I think there's like two people per square mile in Wyoming. So we're extremely rural, wow. and there's lots of space uh, between people. I mean, we're not all standing two miles apart. Some of us congregate more closely. But so how we have always thought in our context about the diaconate and even the priesthood is that it is, has to do with the local discernment. So we say if all of the gifts that are needed to be the church are around the table, we say let's pray together to find who are the people who have uh, sacramental gifts, who are people who have gifts to be an icon for Christ's servant ministry, which would be the deacons. And the person himself or herself doesn't have to say, hey, look at me, I always wanted to be a deacon. The discernment is the whole community praying about that. And sometimes there's somebody who's been holding it in their heart that they've felt that nudge. And sometimes it is the community seeing it in them. And when I was first in Wyoming, we identified deacons locally, and we had the opportunity where I was in Pinedale to identify a deacon locally, and we then did the formation of deacons and of priests locally, in part because we're so far away from each other that there really was no way to get anywhere. And nobody who's a lifetime rancher is going to leave their ranch for three years to go to seminary. So we were resourced by the diocese to do formation in the local congregation and the deacon would be formed along with people who were not going to be deacons so that everybody understood the ministry of the diaconate. And then that deacon was ordained in that congregation and continued to serve in that congregation. Now I know that's very different from the experience of Oregon where often deacons are uh, that formed in the diocese but not do not serve in the congregation where they were they discerned their call they often go somewhere else uh, but that was not the case in Wyoming they the deacons served uh, the congregation where they were formed uh, and called and now the last 10 years I've been able to work with a whole other uh, generation of deacons who have had the opportunity to go to a a diocesan deacon school which is much more similar I think to the Oregon experience okay so all right thank you um, question six our 20 year old agreement with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and our call to common mission invites us into deeper communion what are some of the possibilities to live out that common mission here in Oregon with ELCA and with others great so I say I'm I'm sort of a Lutheran by nature shouldn't out myself like that, but I grew up in Minnesota and Minnesota is the land of the Lutherans and people will say it doesn't matter if you're Lutheran or not if you're from Minnesota, you're somehow constitutionally a Lutheran. And I did do my doctoral work at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, uh, so I have more recently had some Lutheran type formation uh, in my own experience and have uh, connected with uh, Lutherans and in fact my uh, advisor for my thesis and a member of my cohort both had done work on 
Spanish-speaking, English-speaking congregations, and the Lutheran Church seemed to have a lot of leadership in that area and has really um, gone to town in terms of reaching out to Spanish-speaking uh, folks and, and starting Spanish-speaking services and blended churches. I, so I was going to say in, the, in, in, in my experience with ecumenical work, though the Lutheran work that I've done really was primarily centered on worship. It seemed like the common mission was that we recognized each other's worship and recognized each other's leadership, uh, leading in worship. And so I've done lots of sharing of worship with Lutheran congregations, but uh, the new Methodist agreement that's going on right now is less worship-centered and more uh, formation, mission, and fellowship-centered. And so we've been doing a lot of work with our, uh, our sister Methodist church in Cody, and it has felt very different than Lutheran work because they're not so concerned about worshiping together. They're having some other kind of common life and learning about each other's culture uh, and trying to have common mission uh, in terms of outreach uh, with others. And it has been an experience that I have had both in, in our ministerial and in work that I've done with the LDS, uh, a lot of work that I've done on mental health and suicide prevention. We are better together. All right, and then part two of that question, as bishop, what gifts and experience would you bring to deepen that call to live together in a new way? I think that's maybe that what I said. Okay. Just wanted to be sure but I, I also, that. I just want to say to my friends, new friends in the Diocese of Oregon, that I am, I am not, I don't know if to say slavish in my Anglican identity. I am, a, I am a cradle Episcopalian and I feel very comfortable there, but I also feel comfortable sharing and innovating uh, in ways that maybe not all of you are comfortable. But I f do believe that we're better together. And so if there are ways that we can share with our Lutheran brothers and sisters, Methodist brothers and sisters, or you know, even in our case in Cody, we have some very interesting sharing both with uh, our LDS brothers and sisters and sharing in ministry with some very socially conservative evangelical congregations where we find common mission. All right, our last question and a very important one. What would your first 100 days as bishop look like and how does this reflect your understanding of the role of a diocesan bishop? Great. Thanks, Pat. When I first saw in these questions, I was with my daughter and I said, hey, what do you think about these questions? And I think I just read that one to her. And she said, well, I think you should have a party every day. <laughs> and my daughter is 15. So I'm, I don't know what comes to your mind when you hear a 15-year-old say, well, I think you should just throw a party every day. But what came to my mind was, I'm not sure that's who I think I am as a bishop. So I'm thinking, ah, oh, well, thanks, Miriam, but that's not very helpful. But she went on without really missing a beat and said, you know, feed them all the bread and fish they want, and there are going to be at least 12 baskets left over. So she is a preacher's kid. <laughs> and I thought that was a wonderful image for party and an image for a diocesan bishop to be a person who reminds us that we are a people of abundance and God continues to bless us even in these crazy tumultuous uh, times of turmoil in which we live. So I don't believe, um, I'm not quite the party animal that my daughter is, so I'm not sure that I'm going to commit to bread and fish for everybody. Uh, for 100 days here in Oregon should I be elected. But I would like to be present with as many congregations as possible uh, in those first 100 days. I believe that the primary mission outpost in our church is the congregation. And to be able to spend time learning and listening to folks in the congregation, finding out uh, where God in the spirit is leading each of them, uh, I can't imagine a more wonderful first 100 days. And uh, I do believe that if you say what you do at the beginning, that helps set a, a pattern for how you will be in the future. And uh, if the new bishop could have the discipline with the many voices that are calling for the new bishop's attention to focus congregationally uh, for the first 100 days, uh, then I think that is the way that that bishop would be able to continue uh, to focus on how God is alive among us in our worshiping communities today. All Thank right. You. Thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate it.